Liberia. My name is Dennis Ja, and we are broadcasting from Atlanta, Georgia. Welcome to our Friday edition of Focus on Liberia. Today, we're going to be discussing policing in Liberia with specific uh, discussion on crime scene investigation. My guest is Mr. Charles Ebu King. He's the former deputy director of police for CID Affairs, that's the Republic of Liberia, and the founder and creator, and also the first dean of the criminal justice program at the AME Zion Community College at that time. Mr. King, welcome to Focus on Liberia. Thank you very much, Mr. John. Thank you so much for having me. We want to welcome all our viewers across the globe in the wake of the multiple deaths in uh, the span of eight days of people relating to audits in Liberia. We have an alarming situation that getting everybody scared. I'm scared. And so in the wake of that, we want to talk to a former CID, a former deputy police director for CID affairs, a former patrolman, and a former the Dean of the Criminal Justice Program to uh, walk us through policing in Liberia and what will a crime scene investigation look like. Just a little bit about someone who is new on uh, popularly has Coach King. He's a former detective and patrolman of the Liberia National Police, Assistant Director of Police for Administration Republic of Liberia, Chief of Police, Moravia City Cooperation, Deputy Director General of Administration, GSA, and a Director of Special Task Force at the same GSA, Assistant Director for Administration, SSS, that's the Special Security Services, Deputy Director for Training at the Police Academy, Deputy Director of Police for CID Affairs, I mentioned that earlier. And uh, he's also a uh, member in Special Commission of Smuggling and Dangerous Drugs, Managing Director of Hawa Security Systems in Liberia. In fact, one of your recruits told me that you are the pioneer of private security firms in Liberia. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. And um, it's very kind of them. Uh, I am not one to take credit for something that I don't do. Mm -hmm. uh, I followed other professional people in Liberia who had their guard services. What I did, I raised the standard of okay. the guard service industry. And so I'm one that I will always give tribute and honor to those who started something because yeah. they encouraged me to do something better for myself. And so therefore, no, I'm not, I'm not a founder of it, <laughs> uh, but I am, and I do recognize that I helped to raise the standard, standard of private security in Liberia to make it a more of a profession than just a watchman or mosquito police, unquote. <laughs> oh yeah, mosquito police, that's how we used to call. I want to also mention that you're the assistant director of security department at the Jersey City State College. Yes, I want Career that. services coordinator at Stratford University in Virginia. You work with Leslie Co. Associate Security Management Firm in New Jersey. Director of Personnel Training Primary Security Systems in Queens, New York, and Security Training School in Madison Avenue, New York. Yeah. You were also trained, uh, as I learned, uh, by the, uh, is that FBI training program? Yes, I was trained by the FBI National Academy and also the United States Secret Service in Protection Operation Briefing. That's why I was qualified to go to the Special Security Services. I had training for every position that I went into. Oh, wow. Mr. King, we are honored to have you. Welcome again. Uh, what, what took you into this field? Policing, security, and how, how, you got, how you got started? Well, to tell you the truth, uh, Director Edwin Harmon, the late Edwin Harmon, he was one of those police officers that I admired and other police officers such as Simon Smith, uh, 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 Major Peter Y. Wilson and uh, uh, Lieutenant James Fokba. These were all people that we used to see when they walked in the street with their uniforms on. It inspired me. These were people from all over the counties, yeah. from different walks of life that we didn't recognize, no tribalism. 
But these were men that I respected. And, and I've always been inquisitive, wanting to know what's happening around me. <laughs> That's one of my mm -hmm. situations. And so, you know, mm -hmm. um, I just fell into it. I fell in love with it because of what I saw. And, 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 and I began to develop and associate myself with these mm -hmm. strong professional men in the Liberian National Police Force. So that's, yes. that's what inspired me. There used to be a gentleman in, in the street directing traffic. Oh man, I think his yeah. name was Captain Duo or one of the, oh, when you saw the man directing and turning and moving traffic, you just stood up and admired him. Admired, yeah. Tourists, people used to stand up and take pictures of the man. Right. I mean, he had his gloves, his gun, his pearl handle gun, professional man. And he kept that traffic moving. Uh, yeah, I, I saw one of that in the, in the eighties around uh, Vi Town before the, uh, the bridge. And yeah, we we're going to school. We we'll all stop and just enjoy him. Yes, those were people who were trained. Ah, anyway, huh. I'm getting emotional. Let me stop now. <laughs> so I mean, and, and for those of us who didn't really see that, sometimes we like to hear some of these stories. So, just uh, the experience in the past. But tonight we want to talk about investigation, criminal investigation, oh, all that. Of course. Share some of your experience in the past investigating crimes well, in Liberia. You know, it started, it, and I have to start from the police academy in Liberia. I have the original programs that I had at the police academy in 1969. Crime scene investigation taught by Major Peter Y. Wilson and other professional, uh, James Fukba. All of these were professional officers. And so it started in crime scene investigation 101. Mm. You can't just uh, 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 go up into a crime scene and begin to disturb the crime scene. So now carrying on this back into my professional career, when I began to develop and improve myself, I came abroad to study in criminal justice administration, received my bachelor's degree. I was in a hurry to go back home because my promise that I made to my colleagues in the CID when I left was that I was gonna come back and turn over and teach them what I had learned. So now you say the experience of what I had in the crime scene investigation as head of the uh, uh, CID division, I had a number of men and women under my command. My purpose was to train them and direct them in such a way that they will expand in their professional development. I had pe people like uh, Mr. Sam Masakwe. He was my deputy, one of my deputies, uh, chief of operations. Uh, you had uh, Melvin, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Don, you had uh, Wesley, Ed, uh, uh, Duncan, and a host of others that uh, Momo Tishil, Keru. These are men who went on crime scene and Mr. Mm -hmm. Robinson, he was our fingerprint technician mm -hmm. and they dusted for fingerprints in Mr. life. King, you, yes. you mentioned this word now, crime scene, maybe three or four times. Yeah. What is a crime scene? A when crime do we determine it to be a crime scene? A crime scene is a place where an incident has taken place and where the police have been called in to investigate and find the perpetrators of that particular incident. Hmm. That particular crime, it could be a fire scene, it could be an okay. accident scene. That is a scene to be right. investigated. So, and a so crime where something has been committed, a crime has been committed, that whole era becomes uh -huh. a crime scene. When does it become a crime scene? Is it after the investigation or before? Before, long before, okay. before the so investigation. What, so what determines that this place is a crime scene? Because something happened? Or, something because somebody, happened. or because somebody is suspected of doing something? No, wherever you have an incident that you okay. want to find out a solution, right. that era becomes a crime scene. Okay. Because you don't know what has happened in that particular yeah. area. So you have to mark it off and protect it because it has valuable physical evidence. And please, I'm underlining that word, valuable physical evidence, and we're yes. going to come to that. But end your story with your experience with crime scene investigation before we 
Well, it is, it is very important that one must look at an era and keeping people away from the era, you would then begin to visualize the scene to see what eras to exclude and what eras to include into the crime scene, okay? Now, once you have this era protection, again, a crime scene can step, can, can go further beyond the point, the immediate era. But again, that is to be determined by how you look at the crime right. uh, scene and what is involved. If it is a shooting, if it is a direct uh, fighting or stabbing, you will have to look at this situation and then demarcate the era. It may mm -hmm. even extend over afterwards because during mm -hmm. the crime scene search, you may see evidence in the bush, you may see evidence outside that era. And then this is where you can uh, then extend the era to include that as part of the crime scene. It's is, very is there, important. Is there any legal limit to a crime scene that, hey, you can go certain kilometers or no. certain meters? No, no, no limit. There's no, need, no, no legal uh, limit at all, none at all, because you're looking for physical evidence trace evidence and transfer evidence that comes from the victim to the perpetrator and from the perpetrator to the victim. The, the, the perpetrator takes away evidence from the crime scene as well when he's leaving yeah. or she's leaving, whoever it is. The victim. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you are just joining us, this is Focus on Liberia. We are in discussion with the uh, former deputy chief of police at the uh, for CID affairs at LNP, that's the Labrador National Police, Mr. Charles Ebel King. Mr. King, uh, so how, how does the police get called into a crime scene? Does it have to be calling? And in, in America, I know there's 911. Mm -hmm. for, for Liberia, what happened? How does police get involved in a crime scene investigation? Well, at the time when I was there, you, re you must remember, I'm no longer with the law enforcement in Liberia. I don't know what yeah. method has been established. But from what I understand, they have 911 call as well to get the police to the particular area. So anyone can call the police to come in if they observe something that requires the attention of the police. When the police arrives at the crime scene or at a particular area that is declared a, a crime scene, he is supposed to keep the people away from that area. He has okay. to keep the people away from that area. First, of course, if there's a body involved, he has to make sure that that person cannot be saved. In this at this particular point in time, the first objective is to save the person's life, okay? Mm -hmm. You can't say, well, I'm protecting the crime scene. No, someone is in need of help. He has been injured or uh, whatever, and you must be able to, at that point, give first attention to that particular person. Once mm -hmm. that person receives the attention, either first aid or some way, form, or manner, carried off to the necessary hospital by an ambulance or whatever means you see, then a police officer stays at the area and protects the area and keep people away. Mm. After that happens, after that happens, then the CID investigator is called in. The CID investigator comes to the crime scene to evaluate the situation, talk with the officer, the first officer who arrives and finds out information from them as much as possible but the detective must come to the crime scene to take a look at what's happening. You have another detective, no doubt, that may go to the uh, hospital to find out any information they can from the victim if he is not completely um, immobilized. So, so when a police is called, who, who, how is the determination made as to who goes? Is it by rank? Is it by special division it, no. or just anybody? At the CID, we had theft of property, homicide investigation. We had the crime scene investigator. We had theft of property, auto theft. So whatever uh, category of crime or incident that has taken place, that particular detective division responds to the crime scene. And before the detective, the first it will be before the, before the CID investigator is called, mm -hmm. it can be any police officer. Well, it, it and well, yes, any police officer that is called for assistance, mm -hmm. he responds to the crime scene. Law enforcement officer goes anywhere. The officer in uniform should be trained as part of the police academy training in crime scene investigation protection, first aid, and other type of aspects of law enforcement. 
but he has to understand and recognize a scene of a crime in order to protect and preserve the evidence. Okay. So um, I know you're no longer part of the uh, Nas Labro National Police, but how up to date are you with what goes on there as of today? Oh, yes, I keep in touch, you know, <laughs> in law enforcement, uh, uh, you have to keep in touch. I am also a state certified private security instructor for the state of Virginia. So I'm always having to keep up to date with uh, activities in the area of law enforcement and private security. In Liberia, yes, I'm very much aware of what's going on in Liberia. Okay. So being aware of what's going on, let's go into the specific. In, okay. the, in the span of eight days, there have been four reported uh, deaths in Monrovia, or uh, uh, the greater Monrovia area. So I, first of all, and we're gonna go one at a time, what, what, you know, what are you hearing? What do you know about what well, happened? Only from what I see in the newspapers that is reported, a Daily Observer as well as Front Page Africa, um, I have seen that the first uh, situation that caught my attention recently is the bodies of a man and a woman that was discovered in a vehicle uh, parked on one of the streets of Monrovia. That is what mm -hmm. I know so far, and I've read the reports. As I said, again, I'm not reading any official police report, but only from my general reading and my observation of whatever mm -hmm. I see. So, so from, from, what we, from what you see and read in the police report, all these four incidents can be determined as crime scenes. Definitely. Definitely. Right. The, car, the car becomes a crime scene. No one can go and touch, touch that car at all. But of course, again, the police officer who arrives at the scene and sees bodies in the car has to make sure that they are alive or dead. Right. You can't just stay outside. A person could be uh, alive and needs first aid. So once they have determined that those people in the vehicle are no longer alive, then the scene, again, everybody must be kept back by the other police officers. So they so are important look, in this. Yeah, so let's look at that first, uh, where we have uh, Ms. Uh, Gifty Lama and uh, Albert who were in the car. So what happened at that point? What what can be done to protect that particular scene? What we would do uh, at the CID at the time, coming across a scene like that with, with my uh, agents involved, they will first determine, it is first determined that they, they, uh, they, they are not living, they're dead. Then you would call in, the uh, protocol would be to call the, um, medical examiner, in this case, the pathologist, uh, who would come in and look over the body and perform the procedures that they are required to do at that level. Right. Remember, it's been X number of years since I've been back now, but he will do that. And then he would declare that the body now can then be removed to the facilities for him to conduct an on this body more careful not on his part, but a more careful investigation. In this case, uh, the pathologist will conduct an autopsy and go through all the different parts of the body to determine what type of evidence can be obtained from the body that can connect with anyone who may have been associated at that particular time. Mm. And what would be some of the evidence that people will be looking for, the CID, the pathology, and whoever on well, that crime scene? The CID would, in this case, look for anything that would be abnormal, look for dirt, fingerprints. Again, the fingerprint technician would be there. They will look for any type of liquids, bottles, anything that looks out of the ordinary, anything that looks in disarray, any paper, anything at all. Maybe they might even want to uh, find out what type of smell was in the vehicle at the mm -hmm. time anything at all. And after initially looking at this, the vehicle has to be removed from the spot by the proper police authorities and taken to an area where they can conduct a more in-depth investigation. Soil, example, soil on the ground, what type of dirt is on the back seat or front seat? Did there appear to be a struggle? Of course, there's one step that I should have mentioned and that would be for uh, photographing the crime scene. 
Okay. Before, once the police uh, protects everyone and and uh, the body, the it is known that they they, they are deceased now. They are not living. The phot photographer comes in and he takes a picture of the location in all areas, just the outside of the car. And then when you open the car door, the position of the bodies in the car. You would take picture of the position of the uh, the uh, persons who's sitting behind the driver's seat. You would take a position picture of the uh, the uh, the brakes, the accelerator, and all that. You would look at the shoe that he has on. Everything must be photographed, and it mm -hmm. must be photographed in a certain way, in a certain order. When you're photographing something, you should have a you should have a ruler so that you can sit, show it in perspective in terms of measurement. After that, then the vehicle is removed to a more mm -hmm. a private area where more in-depth uh, investigation of that particular car vehicle or whosoever it is can be done. So, so at that point, what will constitute temp tempering with evidence or anything that can be done to destroy evidence? And we're still using these vehicles as a, they, they are saying, this saying has an example. What will constitute destroying or tempering with evidence? Well, anyone who is not authorized to uh, to investigate anyone who's not part of the investigative team is tampering with evidence. Once you go in and try to touch anything, you've tampering with evidence. You can't say you don't know what evidence is. You're not supposed to be there. Hmm. You have I to know leave something, to the professionals. When something happens, you see the crowd, everybody is surrounding the place and it's so packed that, you know, so what? The, what's about how the police go ahead telling everybody what has happened? You know, well, the, most, the process. The most anyone, first of all, is so difficult to keep crowds away. But when you get there, you take as much step as necessary to push the crowd away so that they do not contaminate the evidence. There's no way to stop them before you come because people just mm -hmm. are curious, curiosity. They will go around, touch the field, but you just have to move them away. Now, the next question was what? How do you inform and what do you inform the public? Yes. The public has a right to know. The public has a right to know what happened. A body, two bodies or three bodies, whatever was found in a particular area and the police are investigating. The police is not required to tell step by step what they are doing and what they have uncovered. That's why I'm being careful not to mention some things that, that could be uncovered, you see? The police don't do that. You're not supposed to tell people, they, they, oh, I found this, I found that. I've, no, you don't do that. Not at all. It is something that they want to know, which is something has happened. The police are investigating. That's all. Now, normally you push that to the public relations. But when I was at the CID, as chief of CID, I, I comment on everything that goes into the newspaper. And any information now, at the same time, you would ask if any information uh, is possessed or if any members of the public <clears throat> have information to pass on to us, to please let us know. I don't have to invite them down. I will send my agents to them. They're not compelled to bring information. <clears throat> so you wouldn't tell them to come down. You would go to them and collect the information. And how is that information also, or the, the briefing, how does it go up the chain? Even if they're high profile something, how does it get to the president, for instance? Well, I don't know what procedure that they have in place. All I know at the time when we was at the CID, all information comes to the director of CID affairs, and he determines at what stage of the investigation to pass that on to the uh, Minister of Justice for channeling to his superior boss. But we have an investigative right. If I don't feel that I should release information, detailed information to the Minister of Justice, I will not. I'm still investigating and any type of information that can be contaminated or, 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 or passed on to someone else, no, nah, you don't mess with my investigation. My officers, okay. my detectives are sworn to investigate and they don't bring anything outside the organization except through me. Because when anything happens, I'm responsible as director of CID. Right. Like, like in the case of the um, Albert Peters and Gifty uh, 
Lama, the the, uh, the president commented on the on the cause of death, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Would that be would that be such a briefing that he got from the justice ministry or from somewhere, or he may just be speculating? I I read that, and I have no idea where they get their information from. Uh, if in at the time when I was deputy uh, was at the CID, my my uh, minister of justice and the president of Liberia knew of my capacity and capability. And they know that when we, I was investigating something from the CID, they would know to always make sure to find out from the Minister of Justice and he from the director of CID if such and such an information can be re released. Because I don't want anyone jeopardizing my investigations. Right. So I really don't know how the process is, but definitely anyone would have the, uh, uh, you know, the president, the minister, anyone can say anything they want to say, but that would mm -hmm. not hamper my investigation or influence my investigation at all. And what, now, what would you do well, in that manner? Would you, what would you do if, uh, let's say, the uh, justice minister or the president or anyone commenting on an ongoing investigation has to give clues as to what has happened? What would you do as a head of that investigation? Will you what, get out publicly to correct that or what will you do? Uh, through the chain of command, if I feel that the information that was given out um, interferes or delays or compromises the investigative level in which we have been reached in the case, I will make that known to the Minister of Justice for him to carry that out to the head of state or whoever could be a minister, a senator, whoever said it to let them know that they have jeopardized my investigation and now made it more difficult. Again, that's their choice to do what they want, but yeah. it cannot interfere with, uh, I cannot allow that to interfere with the success of my investigation. So as in long the as the information is just general, ah, yeah. ah, you can make a general statement if you like, you make, but right. if I inform the Minister of Justice that I have a certain piece of evidence that is only known to the, um, to the criminal or the perpetrators of that crime, I'll get upset, definitely. Mm -hmm. You put me in charge of an investigation and then you want to jeopardize it? What are you trying to do? I don't play around, you know? This is science we're on. So if- So, so, so in the case of the president's statement, will you consider that as jeopardizing the investigation or, well, it's just a statement? I don't know how far the investigation went. From what I'm seeing and reading in the paper, that may be his opinion that there may have been some relationship. I don't know. Again, you have to be within the investigative stage to yeah. find out if what someone says jeopardizes. If we had found out, for example, that there was some intimate relationship through right. some investigative information that we received or through a member of the public, I won't have to call that person and say, come down if you have information. No, I go out and set my agents out because you have two types of witnesses, those who don't want to give information and those who want to give information. And those who want to give information, they can turn right away in the manner in which you approach them. Yeah. So you have to know how to handle it, you see. Mm. And then if that is the case where we found out, then I would take the necessary uh, steps towards informing whoever it is, my immediate boss will be the Minister of Justice. I would say, mm -hmm. look, my investigation has been interfered with. That should not have been brought out. Now he yeah. is his responsibility to talk to his boss, not me. Okay, yeah. It's so, a chain so of command, case, it's important. In the case of the death in the cause, what the length of time such investigation may typically take? You mean how long would it, should an investigate? It depends. Yeah, spe specifically to the those who die in the car, or Abra Peters and Gifty Lama. Okay, I'm just, regardless of the name, I just see two bodies. The names yeah. don't make a difference to me because investigation is investigation. Okay. Um, depending on what the uh, pathologist performing the autopsy will come up with. You see, we work hand in hand. Mm -hmm. He can say to me, 
that someone died in such and such a manner. My, my input is what caused that action to take place. So the, the, the pathologist will say, you know, I found such and such a bullet or I found such and such a, a, a knife, uh, a piece of a knife that was broken off or the knife is in the body or whatever. Uh, I found maybe poison, something that they may find from the victims. Right. And then we'll say, you know what? What do you think, Doc? Could this have been done somewhere else? Could this have been done in the car? Give me some idea. The, the pathologist may say, you know what? Because of this fast acting uh, 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 serum or liquid, it would have to be administered immediately. The body maybe was, uh, they can determine the time of death. So depending on that, we will do a careful analysis of the crime scene, which is inside the car. So looking for every available clue. The fact is you have to sweep that place from top to bottom yeah. because you don't know what's there. So just mm -hmm. to look inside and say, well, Okay, just clear the seat. No, you got to look everywhere. The person may have sat in the back of the seat. Something may have dropped out. You don't know. So the car has to be done completely from top to bottom. Every aspect, even the tires of the vehicle. Even the mm -hmm. tires of the vehicle have to be checked for dirt to find out where that dirt is from. What part mm -hmm. of the city is from. Yeah. Everything. Even underneath, the, the, the you have to lift that... Uh, that uh, vehicle up and look on the bottom. What is there? That's how you investigate. You don't just look at a car and say, this is it. Every part of that car is a crime scene. Look in the mm -hmm. trunk of the car. You never know what's there. And, and what the, the, the role of technology plays. So without some of these uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, instruments or devices in a place like Liberia, how difficult it is if we are not, you know, we don't have probably, we don't have a fingerprint material. We don't have things to determine the forensic details. Well, what do we do? I'm happy you brought that up, Mr. Jav. Now, I will lead up to that answer that I question. Throughout the years, during President Selly's time, during, uh, who else? The, what, whoever presidents were there before and from the Selly administration, most especially, from the Selif administration on up. Um, we've heard that, I've read that France donated a mobile crime scene lab. I saw the pictures of the ambassador and some officials of the police. I never saw the crime scene lab. We hear this country has donated this. This country has donated that. Well, where are those particular instruments? Where are those particular materials that the country donated? I've worked in a mobile crime scene lab before, a complete uh, a vehicle. I could do chemical analysis, blood sampling, all kinds of evidence collection in the crime scene lab, right there in a the mobile lab. We could conduct every imaginable type of, of experiments and uh, analysis. Now you say in Liberia, mm -hmm. in the absence of fingerprint technicians, well, just here the other day, you sent, I think more than 15 or more than, I don't know the number, but it was more than, I counted more than 10 officers to the to, to do training in one of the states in Virginia. What did they come to do training for? Fingerprint is basic. Crime scene investigators, why they didn't take, why they didn't take those uh, training programs. Now you say in the absence of that, when the F, when the NBI National Bureau of Investigation, headed by professional Patrick Minicum, they had fingerprint technicians, handwriting technicians, and when it was necessary, they took the the particular material to be analyzed to the University of Liberia laboratory, mm -hmm. and it was analyzed there. Sometimes, yeah. if, for example, if you want to um, analyze the soil, the consistency of the soil. Let's give me a minute. Let me correct that. Okay. Go ahead. The consistency of the soil. They would take it to Lamco, or the, if it's blood, they would take it to the uh, JFK Medical Center, and they had the laboratory there that could analyze and come up with some form of decision mm -hmm. or, or, or results. 
Right. So when you say the lack of, because the lack of equipment, come on, what were we doing before equipment? We right. collect the physical evidence and you can still make a connection. If you analyze it and investigate that crime scene properly, you can still get results. And what and is that properly also, in the absence of, okay, go ahead. One more thing. Mm -hmm. Those of us who were trained at the FBI Academy were told how to collect and preserve evidence and forward it to the FBI for major investigations. One of the senators uh, in the uh, Liberian government is a FBI graduate as well. I think we've had two or three people. For your information, I'm the oldest living uh, person who has attended the FBI candidate from Africa. So we have people in Liberia. I think it's Senator Zago. We have a Senator Zago in the, uh, in the Liberian Senate. He is an FBI graduate. He knows about collection and preservation of physical evidence. Hmm. I, I read one of your articles and um, in the Daily Observer and, and one of the uh, readers asked you say, but uh, Mr. King, why can't you get in touch with us directly and, and help instead of writing the paper? Well, yes, uh, those are narrow-minded little people who have no idea who they're talking to. And as such, where is, what has he contributed? Does he have any idea how I have made connections and no one has called me back? Has he, what he should have done was say, Mr. King, could you tell us something? But you make a statement like that to me. I don't have time to deal with narrow-minded children like that. They have no idea who they're mm -hmm. talking to. You know, I've, you, I have communicated okay. and no one replies. So I write, and on top of that, just because when someone writes something in a paper, you know, when I was deputy director for CIA affairs, I never, ever, chastise any member of the press. I encourage them to write. If they wrote something that wasn't correct, I'll go in the paper and make a correction again. I don't have to threaten them. In fact, I love criticisms from mm. the public. And those are the things that make you and improve yourself. And that's mm. what can improve the police. But some people don't like criticisms, you see. Mm. And they rob themselves of the future. Before we go to the next uh, crime scene, let's talk about the president's call for the United States to help. So assuming the United States is going to help, what are they going to be looking for and what can we do to, pro to um, protect that crime scene before the United States people arrive, if they will get there one day? Well, uh, as I mentioned, I think I wrote in that article that whatever they do on an international level, I know what is normally done because of my previous experience. But leaving that aside, what we have to do, the police will have to, the detectives who are trained in crime scene investigation will have to preserve all the evidence that they can find from that vehicle. They have to preserve it. And that's a way to protect. You don't just take it and put it in a glass jar and keep it. <laughs> you, you, have to, you have to consult with the pathologist to make sure that any type of, uh, degradable type, type of evidence is properly protected. So what we have to do is we have to follow the proper procedure because mm -hmm. the FBI from what I under, or the American government, whoever they will send, they can't take a evidence, piece of evidence that's contaminated. What do you expect them to get from it? Even how you collect metal scraping from, from an object, the item that you use, the scalpel to remove the item from a particular location. That item itself that you use has to be protected. So it's not just scraping hmm. something and keeping it. There's a procedure. Right. And so if it is not followed, the evidence is contaminated. And it would be very difficult right. for any scientific investigation. I said difficult, it is impossible, difficult. It could yeah. be even become impossible because yeah. it has been contaminated. Right, and uh, when I read that story, I said, well, um, Crime scene investigation, even though I have no background, is not like sassy wound where you don't have to do anything, just apply sassy wound. But for crime scene, there should be evidence, right? So, yes. I, I, so what are some of the things that our police CID need to preserve to keep 
for the maybe FBI or whoever is sent, if we are lucky, to look at. And, and how difficult is it going to be if that is contaminated? You say it's going to be difficult, not impossible, but I think it's going to be impossible. Well, I can't use the word impossible because of the advancement of science these I'm days. I'm free to <laughs> use it because I don't... I, I'm, I, no, no, no. I know you're free to use it, <laughs> the most welcome, but I'm saying you, you, you shouldn't because that word yeah. impossible, 25 years ago, it was impossible. Now it's possible. Because of see, science. That's what I'm saying. Okay. I don't mean any harm. Um, um, the, what the evidence, you need evidence to prosecute. You need evidence to connect. Now, after you have obtained the evidence that can connect A with B, the victim that is murdered, now, if you are going to arrest that person, you have to have the evidence that will contribute to the prosecution. And the evidence has to be solid. You have to get your evidence that connects the person with the crime scene and the crime scene with him and he in connection with the body. You have to bring a close as connection as possible. You may find evidence on the crime scene that connects maybe, maybe a person's watch, for example that was dropped on the crime scene. Okay, he said he never see, saw Mr. A before, but yet his watch is there. But someone could have stolen the watch and used it in the crime, right? So yeah. that type of evidence now comes into play to be kept so that next thing, um, let's say the, uh, the perpetrator who you're suspecting, let's say he was at a uh, scene at a local bar recently within such and such a time and, and he was there and he looked at his watch, but then was his watch stolen? If he looked at his watch while he was in another location, this is what witnesses can do. This is what you investigate. You have to, you see, you have to cover everything. Did you mm. see this person? I'm, I'm talking about the suspect now that you may have. Did you see this person at a certain location? Yes, oh, he was here. And he was saying, let's go, now it's time. And he looked at his watch, oh really? And then he says his watch was stolen at such and such a time. You see, these are little, mm -hmm. little information you piece together. This is what the professional police investigator will do, mm. you see? Yeah, let's, talk, let's talk about the role of politics and uh, what the police or the CID can do to fend that off because uh, they are political figures, sometimes they are murder or, and, you know, and there is, so how, to what extent does politics interfere with your work or the work of policing in Liberia from your experience? Oh, I have experience with that. <laughs> um, I've had a lot of experience with that. And one of the experiences I can tell you about, and that's all I can say, politics will always be there. It will always influence, come to try to influence you but you have to be strong. You have to be so strong that you are willing to lose your job for your professionalism. Mm. You have to be willing. I can remember a gentleman uh, when we were investigating at the CID was uh, at the Capitol building, the Capitol building in Monrovia. A person there embezzled, no, I'm sorry, embezzled. Uh, a person there, excuse me, stole, I think it was $90,000, 50, 90 or $100,000, something like that. It's, it's been a long time, but my yeah. agents who, and they're still around, which can remember. So the agents went, investigated and was able to find a person who works in the Capitol building, who worked in the Capitol building and we had him arrested prepare the prosecutive summary, which is a special setup that I set up in Liberia at the time at the CID. And we were going to, we are putting our case together. And uh, a representative from the Capitol building hmm. came to see me in the office. Brown envelope. Day. Oh yes, oh yes. And um, they, my orderly brought him, said, Honorable so-and-so uh, 
is here to see you. I said, oh, no, so, so to see me? What do you want to see me about? Because uh, at that time, Sam Masakwe mm -hmm. was my uh, chief of operations and nothing came into the police CID unless he knew about it. Anybody who brings a case to the CID and he doesn't know about it, I terminated him. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. We had to maintain a discipline. So I called him, I said, what this man, the honorable wants to see me. He said, you know, I said, okay, let the honorable come in. And the orderly started to close the door of my office. I said, no, 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 leave it open, <laughs> leave it open. And the representative looked at me and said, but oh, can we close the door? I said, no, sir, uh-uh, <laughs> you're not closing the door. Because I know, I know, I understand that I do run politics too. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he sat down. The man, the gentleman spoke to me for almost an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. He asked me about my mother, my father, my brother, my this. And he asked me to release the person we had arrested to him because Mr. So-and-so in the Capitol had asked him to come to me and say that would, they will produce this person to me when I was ready. <laughs> yeah, right, right? I mm. said, no, I can't do so, sir. He kept on talking. I said, okay, may I have a letter from the person in the Capitol building? He said, oh, well, you know, he, he said, said I should tell you, you can, you can trust him. I said, no, sir, I can't trust nobody with a person that has been arrested and charged for stealing 50,000, I don't know what, what amount. You mm -hmm. see, if I had done that <laughs> and that man doesn't show up, the next thing is what? What do you think will happen, Mr. Cha? Tell me, what do you think they would say about me? Quickly, what do you think they would say? <laughs> you brought up the right envelope. They would say the man gave me some money. Yeah. I fool. So, they so let's look at the late Let's look at it. They let let look. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Well, no, I said, let's look at it the other way where there is politics, especially against the government. And so people want to implicate the government or implicate other people in certain things because of the politics. Maybe they don't like them, they want their job or they are doing something straight and they want them, you know, the other way around. So it goes both ways. From your experience, what have you seen? Well, again, I don't, I don't understand that question a little bit. The first okay. one I understood yeah, where you said, the interference, okay. and I stood my ground and I did not release the person. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you what happened. About, uh, about uh, maybe a month later, they moved me from the CID <laughs> mm -hmm. and transferred me to, to, the, uh, to the headquarters. That is what happened. I yeah. had to mention that. I just said, yeah. oh, fine, I took my, Certificates and degrees down, pack my bag, I was out of there. You have to be strong and determined to take the results. Yeah. And they knew they couldn't bribe me and they knew they couldn't control me. I'm a professional. Yeah. I have to wake up in the morning and look at myself in the mirror and I'm gonna sit down and let someone intimidate me and mess mm -hmm. my profession up. It will never happen under my watch. And no you can really. ask anyone who's working my administration I told them if they ever found me involved in anything, they should arrest me. They looked at me, I said, yeah, arrest me. I'm not above the law. Yeah, yeah, the, so the question I was asking is, uh, people because of politics try to implicate other people in crimes mm -hmm. because okay. they don't like them. Or they don't okay. like their politics. Let me answer that mm -hmm. for you. You know, when people take the oath of office, they should read, the Law Enforcement Code of Ethics. As a law enforcement officer, my fundamental duty is to serve mankind, to protect the innocent against deception, the weak against oppression and intimidation, and the peaceful against violence and disorder, and to respect the constitutional rights of all men to liberty, equality, and justice. That's the first ammo of the Code of Ethics. Now you ask me, some people want to get other people in trouble through politics, correct? Yeah. Now, I am a police officer. I am to protect the, in the innocence against deception and intimidation. So if that comes up, it is my responsibility also to investigate and protect that innocent person. 
I hope that answers you because yes, I that, that, an that answered my question. And I want to announce that uh, we have our phone lines open so that we can have people in to interact with you because people are liking the discussion and they want to interact. So call us. If you are there, please uh, call the number that is on the screen to uh, join the discussion. We are uh, speaking with Mr. Charles Ebukin, the deputy CID big man in Liberia. You know, Mr. Cha, uh, I mentioned something also in my article I wrote on that uh, Daily Observer. I said, when you take the oath of office as a police director, a police officer, you must read that code of ethics as part of your, and you sign it. Yeah. That's the ethics. And you have to follow it. That's just the first part. Yes, go ahead. The second, the second death, uh, a crime scene was uh, an Arab Liberian who according to the news we got was he was driving and he lost control and all the nine yards, right? Yeah. A lot of stories came out say that's not the case. Should, should that be coming out of, uh, should that be that initial story we heard? First of all, let me take a, a, a back step and say, what do you know about that second case? Just what you know, and um, what I read in the newspaper, it was so confusing to me. I mean, a man driving, uh, how fast was he going? That he would swerve and hit someone and then land up in someone's house or hit a house? I, I they, the they, they, <laughs> they report from the, invest, from, from the news reporter was not as clear as it should be. And I want to mention that I did offer several newspapers to train their, their uh, uh, reporters in investigative reporting, but uh, they didn't follow up as much as I would have liked them to. In, but, the, second, in the second day, we, we first heard that the person fell from somewhere, you know, fell. Should, should these things, or would that be something that would be coming from the police or is just something in the air? When you mean, you mean like, that, the, the driver is driving, he lost control. Okay, okay yeah. yes. Now, you have traffic investigation. Major uh, John Wallace, he used to handle the traffic uh, in Liberia. Again, that also becomes a crime scene because you want to investigate how did this person lose control of the vehicle to hit someone? I don't, it, 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 you know, here again. It, it's what I read in the newspaper. Yeah. And it was very confusing to me. And then ends up in a house. How fast mm -hmm. was he going? And, and but do you think that information can come from a police officer? Or it makes sense for a police officer to say, well, this is what happened. Well, I do not feel that a police under Major uh, Wallace at that time, I do not feel that he would permit an officer to make a statement at all about what happened to the press until it had been properly investigated because you have insurance issues involved, you have death issue involved, family, liability, all these th type of things come up and you don't just go out talking. No one should talk to the uh, press, to the public, except to the public safety, the uh, public affairs officer, of the police, should I still talk? Because I see something cut off. Yeah, no, I, I want to bring in our callers. Oh, okay. so that they can. Well, have they I can answered? Answer. Have I answered that one for you? Yeah, you you, you answer that. And uh, there are some people on the line who's going to even ask better questions than I do. So I, want I to hope I'll be able to answer them. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a call here from uh, Edmonton Abada. Your name and where are you calling from? I see Edmonton. So let me, uh, I will call up from Canada. What's your name and where exactly are you calling from? My name is Francis B. I'm calling for Edmonton, Alberta. Francis B, please uh, pump up the volume a little Francis bit. Beer. Francis B. Go ahead, Francis, you are live. Yeah, okay. Now, it's not a question because first of all, I think that uh, Mr. King already has Playing detail based on the question you're asking. But the problem, the, 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 the area here is with how can we improve 
in the state when it comes to law enforcement. I think that will be then they'll be in there to private because if you even ask question around what question will you be asking? Because the pop already laid down things. So for me what I'm saying for already growing in Liberia and after all the pop I laid down for you guys that <laughs> what the life those days and see true policing and kind of policing within Liberia right now, that tell you what can we do better. So okay. the only thing I can say two things. If we Liberians, the book is called both in a way, should clean their mind of two things. One, the new thing now in the library happened with police, so you're not part of the struggle. So I guarantee you right now, if Mr. King has the opportunity to go to library and work, because you're going to ask, somehow they can deputy or work somebody that has no knowledge to law enforcement. Why? Because he's part of the struggle, as they quote the quote. Secondly, we need to wash our mind from those things about. It's a Congo man, it's a native man, and this and that. And we have the same, I say, oh, he's in America when he see you. I hear what people use that term. If you've seen a man living in America and you'll see him run away, they'll put a system in place that will restrict people who work in Liberia, and you think they, they'll see you and they run you the back. I end the day, it still falls back to how work can we improve. So, Mr. King, I just want to stop. You lay down pretty good, I think, for we, the young people, to learn. And for those things, Pacify law enforcement, I think it should be taking a note right now on what you're saying and do the right thing. And those two things, Mr. Mr. Jair, if those two can get out of the mind of Liberia, will be better. Because you live in the Western world. I live in Canada, I live in America. All around the world, if you're doctors, doctor, lawyer, action engineer, the list goes on. You live in the Western world. If Liberia can just be trans, I mean, honest with yourself and let people come back when invest that time in our country, like what Ghana is doing. And, 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 and I would call you one other places will be better. Now the time mm-hmm. is, I mean, of his age right there, he's saying in this. He's taking out anything he needs to do things. He's lecturing the someone in the classroom. But I guarantee you right now, if he's sitting back home, the next thing you hear, he's not part of the struggle or his conglomerate. Mm-hmm. And so the thing is being erased our mind, we're going to be in the same thing. Thanks so much. Yeah, th- th- thank you, Francis. Mr. King, just hold on. Let me take one more caller and then you can respond. Okay. Alexander Niemann, your call out your name and where you're calling from. Alexander Niemann, that's correct. I'm calling from London, Ontario. How are you, Mr. John? Oh, we're getting all our folks from, and from Canada today. Go ahead. Welcome to Focus on Liberia. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to share uh, my own thought on um, the, the conversation. And I also want to... Um, uh, respond to a comment that um that was posted someone saying um there is no um educated public people in the police um i think uh, that was bio who made that statement and uh i 100 percent disagree with that statement um as because um as somebody who has been uh part of uh, uh the police force i can tell you for a fact that there are very, very much educated people in the police now than it was prior to um, the on-mill uh, recruitment process. I can tell you that for a fact. That's one. The second thing I also want to speak to is the uh, political interference and the political influence. When on-mill did the recruitment process in Liberia, that was part of the uh, restructuring process. So make sure that the police is free from political interference or influence. And one way they thought of addressing that was to have a commission, like a board of commission, that would do the vetting of people and submit names to the president so that he can appoint. But that person is going to be the, the, the director of police will only be accountable to the board. So the board will be the one, if for any reason that person does something unethically, it will be the board that will be making the recommendation again to the chief executive to maybe relieve that person. And that person will be seven days upon on a contract level. Like why it is done in Ghana, for example. For, for, the, for the head of a police appointed, you have the board, a civilian board that will be, will be comprised of veteran law enforcement officers, uh, lawyers, uh, civil society groups. They will come into the veteran and submit names. That reduces the level of political interference and influence. So that police director who is coming, he knows that I have a term. My term is five or six years or seven or eight years. I wasn't like 
given this position because I belong to the particular political party. Right now, that is what is happening in Liberia. So it makes it very, very difficult for a police to be a void of political interference. That's another thing we need to address. Lastly, we need to address the funding. Police is not getting the funding, the necessary funding that they need to fight crime. People run to the police only when there's a major issue that occurs in the country. I can tell you for a fact right now, when I used to be there, the forensic department of the police, they lacked the basic forensic tools to even carry on a crime scene investigation and let think of print from other crime scenes. Do you know how much that kit costs? The kit alone for a forensic, for, for, for the forensic officer to go on the crime scene and lift the print, and lift the print. They don't have it. How do you solve a crime that, of that nature that just happened on Broad Street when police officers don't have the necessary equipment? All we do is just cry, cry, and make all the political noise only when there's an issue. But we forget to know when the cake is being divided, we don't put our money where our mouth is. We only run to the police only when we need something. Look at the police on the street. Do you know that the police don't even have a uniform to wear? Just come on yeah. uniform. At least to talk about the equipment that it needs. So until we can address the systemic issue that has to do with law enforcement, we'll keep going in cycle and just keep talking and talking and talking and talking. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Uh, so in, in essence, what you're saying is uh, the police is not funded and we, we don't know why. We know why. We know why. The reason why, the reason is simple. The okay. people who are dividing the cake, few, the people who are dividing the cake, they feel that the police don't deserve the necessary funding. That's basically when, what when it is. Look at how many lawmakers are making. When you say the people dividing the cake, it reaches from the it reaches from the executive to the lawmakers. The executive okay. submit the budget to lawmakers. More the uh, lawmaker approves it, right? Uh -huh. They make sure they have the check and balance. They are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. So at the end of the day, you listen to the IG, the Inspector General of Police, he was complaining that they need extra money in the budget to be able yeah. to function effectively. It's not happening. They are in Thank people's pockets. What do you expect? Thank you. Mr. King, you got, you got two, two of our callers to respond. Let's hold on one minute before you come in. Yes, sir. Okay, I will take the last one that talked about the political, um, what he was just talking about, the spread, the dividing of the funds and, and, and all that. You know, I've often heard when uh, government officials talk, they will get up there and say, the government should do this, the government should do that, the government should do that. And I've often said, but you are the government. Yeah, exactly. That, that when you go up to take on, and, and in this case, I'm talking about law enforcement. That's that's my area. If you minister of this or min, that's different. I am in law enforcement. If you call a person to take on uh, the police department as, as a chief of police or another investigative services as the head of that organization, you have a responsibility to educate and to advance and to promote your organization. Mm -hmm. You must be able to get up there before you open your mouth and say, oh, I will become, yes, I will be the chief of police in this era. Before you do that, you have to ask them, are they serious? Are they serious? Because you're representing a professional organization from around the world. You don't just go up and say, and answer the question, I want to be police chief or someone is offering, whoever uh, uh, makes you the offer. You have to ask the person, are you serious? Do you want a police force? Do you want an organization? Do you want to protect the citizens of this country? If they say, yes, I want, then you say, this is what I need. If you don't give me this, I cannot accept the position. You're not gonna take me, put me in a position and then watch me fail. So that's all you got me for, to watch me fail? You must give me the necessary thing and I will go to the uh, senators, you want to improve? No, this is what I need. If you can't give me this, then I can't take the assignment. Why must I say yes and then when something isn't going right, I say, I need money. What do you mean you need money? You don't know what, you don't know what your organization needs before you get there? 
And in law enforcement, no one can tell me, well, uh, Mr. King, uh, I really didn't know. You can't tell me that. Come on, man. I'm not a fool. You know what the situation is. And when the foreign countries come and say they want to help, we want to give you 50 motorcycles. I don't want 50 motorcycles. I want communication sets. When another company come, a country come and say, I want to give you typewriters. I don't want no typewriters. I want computers. That's what you have to know what it is you want in crime prevention. You are the chief law enforcement H, uh, officer in the Republic of Liberia. You are responsible for the safety of everybody within the 43,000 square miles of your country. So and no, you have to demand, you have to demand the necessary funding for it. Yeah. And it's your responsibility to answer the first person now. This is the second person. To go back to the first person, the responsibility of a chief of police or any head of an organization in law enforcement is to uplift the quality of service. You don't have to wait for the president to tell you or the minister to tell you what to do. You should have your plan in action. You have to professionalize. I train people at the police academy to be better than I am. You have to have a purpose and you have to have a commitment and integrity. You cannot just take on people and say, this is law enforcement and you don't seek their interests. They have families. They have also a love for the profession. But if you don't give them that, the wherewithal to increase their love, how do you expect them to be professionals? You travel to all the different countries. You travel to conferences. You have all the necessary uh, uh, regalia on you. And you come out in the street and you see your officer not properly uniformed. Come on. I'm, don't mince my words. That's why no one, no one can handle me because I talk straight talk. And I can feel that right now. I don't have time for play around. You have people's lives at stake and people who are being killed in Liberia and murdered and traffic safety, you're responsible for those things. You can't say the government should do this. You are the government. Talking about the government this, the government that, you are the government. Once you accept that role, that badge I accepted as a public faith and trust to be held only as I am true to the ethics of the police service. That's part of the code of ethics. Now I say when people read that code of ethics and they sign it, then when things happen and they say, oh, this and that, you show them the paper, yeah, what you sign, my friend? That's how you do it. Hmm. You develop the organization. But everyone, and when I say everyone, some people, will take any position. No, you're not going to do that to me. Yeah. Mr. You King, have to have a standard. In, let me bring in our last caller for the night, Mr. Anthony Gay. Anthony Gay, you are live. Anthony Gay, go ahead. Yeah, um, hello, Mr. John, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, I have myself muted. Thank you very much for having me on the show. Uh, Mr. King, I, I want to say thank you so much. Mr. John, uh, please link up with Mr. King to be having at least one hour per week, if we can, to listen to him, to learn, to prepare ourselves, not only just criminal justice, but many aspects of you know, public service. You heard what he said. You must understand what your department needs. He just spoke to something that I was able to do. I was fortunate to be promoted as a regional trainer of my company and nominated the training to train a, a, a telecommunication technician for six weeks for my company. And when I look at all the new technologies and whatnot, what my, my guys have to learn, I requested for two additional weeks, presented to the owner of the company and said, this is what I need. When I first asked my manager, she said, oh, no, we don't have money for that. I asked the director, he said, no, we don't have money for that. I sent a clean email outlining why I needed the money and why it was going to be necessary for these guys to have an additional two weeks in order for them to be acclimated into the field. And when the man saw the letter, he granted me that. He was like, yes, you can have it, Anthony. Can you imagine? You must know what you want. And I like how you presented the thing. Yeah. People are giving position, and you he always heard me talk about your job functions. 
You must understand what the job is entailed in order for you to carry on the work. Folks are getting jobs in Liberia just because of the title. They don't care about the function. And they don't take pride in what they are getting to do. That's the reason why the country is going that way. We need people that, you know, Mr. King, to educate folks. When you take on oath of office, it is a responsibility. You become an ambassador of that particular agency, government ministry, or whatever position you are, you are carrying on. You are an ambassador of that, of that office. So, so here, the previous caller that said, oh, that we are not getting this, we are not getting that way. That's just excuses. Thank you so much, Mr. King, for coming on here tonight. I can't stop you know, listening to you. I would give back my time. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. King, look yeah. like you are contagious. You, you infected that man right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, it, the thing is, I, my, my only focus is to help develop the profession. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a minister of commerce. I don't know nothing about medical science. I know law enforcement. And responsibility as a law enforcement officer, my fundamental duty, nothing else. If you do not understand the code of ethics and you cannot sign that document, then you can't make it as a professional law enforcement officer. You've got to be able to stand up and say, you know what? Enough is a man. Director, the late director, Eluzon Harmon, he was a man of men. When he stood up and walked in his uniform, when he took an action, he took an action. There, there's a police, uh, a former police officer in Liberia to a teacher at the, uh, at the police at Kennedy, Mr. Wilmot King. He said, hello, Director King. Thank you for your contribution to the private security sector and the overall law enforcement in Liberia. My goodness. Say, your days of integrity and professionalism were the best. Or uh, Joseph, Joseph Gesu George said, please share, please share. We should be very fortunate to listen to a veteran on intelligence. Anthony Gesu, I need to get in touch with you, sir. Wow, I'm impressed. A lot of love here out here for you, Mr. King. Uh, Mr. Charles, I, I owe that. Whatever I am today, I owe it to people like James Fokfa from the Police Academy, Peter Y. Wilson, James White, Golokajo, uh, Briggs, and all the people. I was at the police academy for nine months training. We used to chop out the grass before we can go for a weekend. We used to press our uniform with hot coal, the coal, the coal iron. We used to eat the food. We used to scrub the bathroom floor. We used to scrub the bathroom floor, the toilet, yeah, the toilet floor. We used to scrub the room floor. And when the time comes for, 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 for inspection, your bed better have that corner tucked in so the man can drop a penny on that shit and it drops. You hear me? It got to bounce. I slept with four in a room, people from all the different counties. So those people are the ones that train me that I owe everything of what I am to. People like Fokpa and, and Gilakachu and Peter Y. Wilson and all the staff in 1969. Nine months of training. Hmm. I loved it. It yeah, was a wonderful experience. And they're the ones that trained me together with all the other police officers uh, that was in the police force at the time. Major Wallace, uh, 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 Vani, uh, Vali Kita, another hmm. one on, 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 on public safety. And uh, uh, um, um, App Appleton. Appleton, all of these were people who we shared ideas. We asked, we weren't afraid to ask. If I didn't know something, I asked them. If they didn't know, they asked. Mm -hmm. But the people in Liberia seems not to want to ask nobody because they're supposed to know everything. I don't know everything, I don't. But the people in the CID, my officers, who were professional officers, they made me who I am today. Mm -hmm. They are the ones I owe credit. So if I have a problem, then blame them. They don't want to give it. <laughs> so, so Mr. King, let, let's look at the, the, four, the four deaths now, or I call them the four murders, or these four crime scenes. Yeah. Police officers are in Liberia now are listening to you, CID, everybody else. Yes. So what do you tell them? I tell them, one, if you want to be a professional, 
in this field. You have to expect not to be liked. You have to expect everything will be turned against you. They will make every attempt to break you. But if you want to be professionals and respected around the world, you have to remain solid. When I came over here for the United States to do my training, the first thing, my education, the first thing that the, the, the chief of police in West Haven to ask me, did you go to the police academy? That's the first thing that man asked me. I say, yes, I did. He had my certificate. Everything was open to me, his whole police department. You have to be fearless. You have to stand your ground. You have to understand that you're there for the people. You have to sacrifice yourself because you took an obligation and oath to protect the people of Liberia. And you invest, you have to protect the innocent as well. People can falsely accuse. Just not just because someone's, oh, their mayor is responding, you go take him, handcuff. No, you got to investigate him. He may be innocent. Maybe something psychologically wrong with him. Maybe he right. doesn't even know the difference between right and wrong right. or so, what he has so, been set up for. So you have to focus your attention and advance yourselves. Mm -hmm. You have to advance yourselves. My fellow officers, we love you. We think about you all the time. We and want you to be the best. And what do you advise them on these four crime scenes? The advice on the four crime scenes, well, we've handled one, we've handled two. Yeah. At the third one, we didn't discuss. Yeah, let's discuss the third one. I can remember the lady from the UBA bank, and I'm, I'm going to work backwards and, and jump into a lot of things. The lady from the UL, U, U, UBA, right, UAB bank, she said the camera did not point towards the, the scene where the incident took place. How, now here's a person who has no knowledge about law enforcement. That camera, I wrote, I think I wrote it. Yes, I did write it. I wrote it to her in the UBA uh, newspaper, whatever. And I said, you, you have to make that available to the police investigators because evidence can be obtained from that. Just because it wasn't pointing to the direction of the incident, it doesn't mean it doesn't have evidence. With regards to the era of where that, uh, the, the, what you call it, it was the mark, you know, the, the barrier that you put around the, around what appears to be blood or what they say was blood stain on the ground. I was talking to Mr. Roosevelt um, Cooper, one of the uh, young pathologists from United States here. Uh, he was in Liberia some time ago to look into one other case. Uh, and we both agreed. You see, pathologists and investigators work together. <laughs> you know, it's not isolated. The pathologists say, you know, from the crime scene forensic examination, when a person falls from a building, yeah. certain things happen. And when I looked at it from my trained eyes, <laughs> certain things didn't happen. Yeah, like what? You see? Huh? Well, like what? You see, if you take a bin, if you take a watermelon, take ordinary watermelon. And okay. as an example, I'm not saying this is exact. You take watermelon, go up to that place and throw it down and see what happens. It bursts open. Well, I mean, you will see other parts scattered somewhere else. Those yeah. are things that you have to understand. You also look at the fact that, and he was talking about the tox uh, toxicology, toxicology report. They say he was, now I'm only talking from the newspaper. You understand? Yeah. So who's ever listening, you can't take it that I'm saying, oh, Mr. King said that, that, that. No, I'm using what I see in the paper. He said he was drinking. He would be that drunk to come outside. Well, okay, it's possible. But where's the laboratory report that says the blood alcohol content of, of the person? And then on top of that, was that door locked? Who opened it? Who closed it? Have they done a backwards investigation on the area itself? Not just down on the ground, but you have to go in the house. You have to do investigation of the entire house. 
to find out the movement of people in that house and at the door. And what I mentioned earlier, at the door, at the door, at the door. Where's his bathroom in relationship to his room? Those are questions I, 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 I do not know. I haven't mm. seen his house. But as an investigator, I will go in and find out where's his room, where's his bathroom, where does he normally go, and does he drink, what type of alcohol he had, or they, again, wait for the toxicology report to show me the, the BAC level. You know, I mean, these are things, it's, it's not something that you just get up and say, you know, again, the report said that he was found and they rushed him to the hospital, which means he was still living, fine. Fine, because life comes first, correct? Right. Whatever you do, protect life. You see? So there's other things you investigate. You have to go back in the house. You have to go back upstairs. You have to look at the movement. What clothes did he have on? Did he have his shoes on? Was it tied properly? I can tell when a man ties his shoe, depending on if he's left or right-handed. His socks on, his shirt collar, his trousers, his underpants, everything. There's a man is a creature of habit. Yeah. Has he ever gotten up late at night to go? Has that door ever been opened before? Things like that. That's when an investigator asks, why this, why this, why this, why this? You, mm -hmm. you have to ask those questions and you have to consult with other people. I have, I have contacted certain people to say, they won't even answer you, why? Because, oh, to ask a question means that I don't know. Come on, man, in law enforcement? <laughs> As I said, uh, mm. that's the crime scene situation. Mm. So the, the camera is important. Of course, they are investigating the people, so I can't say anything else about that because I don't want to interfere with anything. But that's what one does. And it's not a secret that you have crime scene investigation. That's what goes on. They watch TV, so no one can say, well, you're releasing. I'm not releasing no information. You can find a doggone thing on TV. You can read in the books. <laughs> now, the, the program I established at the AME Zion Academy, the criminal justice program, I organized that program and created it to be able to help law enforcement officers to go one step beyond at the police academy and to carry the knowledge even further. I struggled, even the legal side, the constitutional law. I wrote all that in connection with, with the police officer in mind for them to enhance their technical abilities as well. Because the Liberian Courts of Law demands evidence, not confessions. In fact, at the CID during my administration, I didn't accept any confessions from not anyone. Yes, mm. I would, none of my agents would bring me a confession statement from anyone. I refuse. You know why? Why? Uh, I was about to ask that. Huh? I was about to ask that why. The Supreme Court stated in Liberia, Evidence is to be considered separate from confessions. The person and his lawyer could say he was forced to make a confession. So what do I have? Just one statement? You don't prosecute a case based on one confession. All the man has to say, I didn't say so. Now what you got? Every officer at the CID followed a prosecutive summary. And if you ask any former C <laughs> CID person during my administration, when you mention prosecutive summary, to know exactly what it is. The collection of evidence that supports your statement that such and such is as it appears and that that person you have arrested committed that crime. Hmm. That's all. So, so uh, from what we know so far about this third crime scene, mm -hmm. If I'm saying something like that, where I say this is suspicious, that, that something bad may have happened, that this person may have been murdered, can I come to that? I don't see anyone who would just walk outside a door and jump. It would be suspicious. As a police, uh, in, uh, police officer, 
everything that happens, I'm suspicious of him until I prove otherwise, until I produce evidence that says otherwise. So definitely it's a, it's, it's, it's a suspicious. Uh, so, so from the, things, the, the way things have gone so far, what do you see down the road in respect to these crimes or to these uh, crime scenes? Well, again, I have to report and tell you that I don't know all what has been happening. I'm not privy to that at all. I'm only reading what the public reads, but I'm also reading and seeing some things that are lacking in yeah. explanation. And, and, and that's where you get, you see, you have to have deductive reasoning and, and, and training in logic as well and deductive right. reasoning. So what do I see happening in these cases? <laughs> Of course, they are trying to, and which is proper, to find out the connection in all these situations that's taking place. Is it one person that's doing this? Is it a group of persons that's doing this? That's what the police are looking into. That's mm -hmm. general information. I'm not releasing anything because obviously when you're investigating a case, you investigate everybody. Yeah. So there's no big secret in that. Uh, what I do, what I do uh, feel is that Remember I said earlier, you have people who want to give information and you have people who don't want to give information. You can remember I mentioned that? Yeah. And the approach to these two different big groups of people is different. You can't say, come down to the office and if you have information, you don't do that. You go to them. You go to them and you send detectives. You don't make no big, oh, we're going to have you don't do those things. That's so, 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 Mr. King, you said there are things lacking. So let's start from top to bottom. Uh, let's walk our way back from the the uh, the one who they say fell from up. What is lacking? Well, I have not heard anything, but uh, what would be lacking there for me is Again, as I mentioned, evidence of the toxi tox toxicology report. Okay. Has he been out drinking before? Uh, where did he drink? It is stated in one of the accounts. Again, this is only on the newspaper. Yeah. It stated that he was there from five o'clock. I think I saw something about yeah, five, five o'clock. Five to 11. Five to 11. In what location? I don't know that era. What did he drink? How many shots did he have? Or right. drinks did he have? Who drove him home? Who drove him home? Who walked him in the house? Or did anyone walk him in the house? Who stayed there with him? Who locked the doors? Those are common things now. Those are common information. Who locked the door? Who has the key? That's why, again, I'm reading in the newspaper, right? Yeah. But why would someone have the key to the house? other than the person who's living there. No explanation there. Of course, mm -hmm. the police are investigating and no doubt they will come up with something perhaps. But what I'm trying to say is the totality of the situation mm -hmm. has to be investigated. Everyone mm -hmm. is suspect, yeah. everyone, mm -hmm. until they are eliminated by proper investigate and you cannot again force them to come down and have a big press conference and bring their lawyers you know what's that that's not investigation man let's go to the second who to say lost control what is lacking uh, did they examine the condition of the person in the car the driver where was his foot at the time of the impact? Can you determine that? Oh, yes. You see, for example, when you are pressing down on the brakes like this, or have your foot on the accelerator, the imprints from the rubber can be seen on your shoes, depending on what type of shoes you have, OK? Uh, but it can be found. Did they examine that to find out what what was the condition of his foot at the time? If he has a clock or a speed cable in the car, at times during an impact, the cable remains in the position upon impact where it was. Was mm -hmm. it at 30 miles or was it at 60 miles? Mm -hmm. You see, 
they break the uh, the headlights. Did the airbags go off? Huh? Yeah, did the airbags go off? Exactly. And one thing also, was it in the nighttime or daytime? Did you say that happened? Yeah. Well, if it was in the nighttime, for example, okay, if it was in the nighttime, you can tell whether if his if his headlight was damaged, was it damaged? And if so, I can tell you whether it was on or off at the time of impact. Because when you when the headlight is on and the glass breaks, the oxidant, uh, I can't tell you the professional and, and scientific effect, mm -hmm. but things get on the filament and you can see whether it was on at the time or off. Maybe it had one light off and one light on. Maybe it was my, um, uh, uh, not functioning properly. Also the airbags. Now this airbag issue comes into the public safety factor as well. Are all these vehicles that are operating on the highway, have they had their airbag uh, bags checked at all? Is it out of, has it been recalled uh, on this type of car? Was it mm. inflated? Things like that. What did he have on his hand? Did he have a cell phone in his hand at the time? Was he listening to music? I mean, all kinds of things mm -hmm. take place. And this is part of the investigation. Mr. Cha, I Thank mean, you. it goes all over the place. Yeah. Did he have a signal light on? Was his tires in good condition at the time? Was the thread on it smooth or was it solid? Hmm. You know, was he careless? Was he negligent? Hmm. What is it? Did someone try to run him off the road and he had to swerve, swerve off? Did someone jump in front of him where he had to turn? I mean, all of these things hmm. are careful investigation. I hope I'm answering some of your questions. Yeah, you, you're, answering, you're answering them and you're doing very well. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> I, I think uh, you, you've, you, you've provided the kind of information we're looking for. Let's, uh, it's time for us to uh, draw down the curtains. Okay. Okay, so we, we, talk, we talk about all the uh, four, three crime scene of four, of all the four bodies. Mm -hmm. let, let, let's, let's conclude on your final thoughts. We have a great deal of work to do in Liberia with regards to public safety. Uh, if we understand law enforcement as opposed to public safety, public safety covers a greater area of concern where I feel that Liberia and the different security sectors should begin to refocus their attention towards public safety. Uh, I have to bring something in quickly. And sure. that is the, excuse me, that is the era of those children that died in the fire at that uh, one religious Lord, organization. Yeah. I think it was 30 some more children. Yeah. Can you imagine I have been, I have followed a lot of things in Liberia and it hurts me, 35 children dies, dies from fire to the negligence of the owner of that building with no escape routes, with no ways to get in and out. And it just goes like this, 35 children, 35 and nothing happens. Oh, well, the fire started on one end. Where's the exit? And you put window bars without a way to get out? There's a gentleman who has a church that was fixing his, 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 his school up. I reminded him, I said, you, if you put in window bars, how will they get out if there's an emergency? 35 children, human beings, and nothing happens? Nothing. You see the difference between law enforcement and public safety. If you had a public safety mindset. Mindset, yeah. You will call that person in and make sure that he goes through some semblance of justice for the 35 children lives lost, the future of our country. 35 of them gone. One, one person one. loses their life in our country. It's a disaster for our nation. 35 children lost their life 
And what has happened? What compensation have the parents gotten? Oh, uh, what? I don't know, but what compensation? Mm. Even the, <laughs> look here, look here. If you don't have that concept and mindset of public safety, you got a problem, my friend, Mr. John. Hmm. Here's a comment here before you, you land your thoughts from Jimmy Eastman. He said, Mr. King, Liberia is known to be a rumor mill and no one dies of natural causes. With your police intuition and IQ, do you assess the information propagated by the media to be credible or just more conjecture? I can't, again, you read the article or you read the reports. I read the reports. I ask you, can you find it? Can you, can, can you say it's credible? What you read, I don't have access to it. I'm only reading and commenting on what I read and the lack thereof, what I don't see there. So I cannot say something is credible or not unless I know the circumstances under which it is written. I know that when I was deputy director of police, I encouraged the newspapers to say what they had to say because the newspaper can provide information that would not normally come to you. So you take the information from the newspaper and you evaluate it, measure it, compare it, weigh it, and use it as part of the investigation. Not to say you would just take what they say and run on it. You take the information, you glean from the information, and then you get your investigators to go and follow it up. Not call the police, uh, not call the, the newspaper article in, uh, I'm sorry, the newspaper reporter, tell me how you got this information. You don't do that. You use the information that is given to you to further your investigation. Yeah. That's how information comes. But everybody is so touchy because nobody wants to make their, uh, let's put it, no one wants to make themselves look bad. What do you mean looking bad? You are serving the public. The newspaper is a free press and the newspaper, we should, we should welcome them. Yes, okay, they go sens sensationalism. They can sell a newspaper. When comments used to be made in the newspaper regarding CID, they made a statement and I, I made my statement and that was it. I'm gonna jail a newspaper person because he said something about me. What I got to do with it? Yeah. I know myself. If I know I haven't done nothing wrong and my agents are professional, I stand by my agent, write what you wanna write, but here's the facts and I come with results. So Mr. King, you can conclude now. I, I, I injected something, so go ahead and land your final thoughts. <laughs> Say it again. You want me to talk about where I see the law? No, no just, just I'll conclude on your final thoughts. You were making your final thoughts when I read it coming from Jimmy. Okay. Um, again, we have to begin to change our mindset in Liberia. And we have to really decide what we want to do. Someone earlier spoke about different situations in our country. The tribalism that goes on, that goes on in the country. All of that affects our development. You mentioned Ghana. That person, remember, he mentioned Ghana and other places, but think about it. Those places he mentioned were all under British rule first. They had a certain basic discipline and that's what is carried on now. But in Liberia, there's no continuity, it seems to be. When anyone comes into a new office, everything what has been done in the past seems to stop and something new start. Everybody seems to, I would say some people, not everybody, but most people seem to want everything to start in now. Everything that didn't start now, June, the, this present administration, nor Ellen Selleff administration, nor Tuckman or Tauber administration, it was started before. People built up the country. One of the books that I recommend people read is the uh, Between the Forest by uh, Patrick, uh, Burroughs. Patrick Burroughs, an excellent book that will really bring together Liberians to find out where everybody is from. And I must say this to you, Mr. Ja. Once the true history of Liberia starts, our people will begin to realize that we have more things in common that separates us. Yeah. One of the most common things that have been said in the past, we always heard about the settlers returning from America, right? 
in the schools than what they used to teach. But tell me, let's be honest. Let's be honest, Mr. John. Did you ever read or hear being taught how the settlers got over there in the first place to return? They didn't teach that in school. They didn't teach how the slaves went from Africa to America. They didn't teach that. The only said the settlers returned. And I've asked everyone that I can think of in Liberia, we only read and was taught when the settlers returned. Ashman, the Disney. I want to know how did they get from there in the first place to become settlers? That is the important thing. Who sold them? Those are all part of the public safety and the mindset change in our country. So we can see ourselves as one people instead of just fighting one another because of the tribe, this and that, majority tribe in this era, the this, what all got to do with it? No one is responsible for where they were born, but they are responsible what they do with their life after they become aware of themselves. So if you were born in one in crew, if you were born poor, the other man was born rich, that's, you don't blame them. What do you do with your life after you were born and become aware? That is what will shape our country. Thank you so much, Mr. King. And we want to appreciate all our viewers and those who make comments. In fact, we, we ran a little pool to say, hey, how are we doing? And 53% uh, say good, 47% say excellent. And oh. that's just from uh, 43 people that, uh, that participated. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, so, so that's, that's, that's very nice. I hope and, that uh, I continue... did, I've done you justice. Go ahead. Yeah, we want you to continue to watch us at Focus on Liberia. What we do here is always to educate, to elevate and promote all things Liberia. Uh, so as people from Liberia, uh, so Mr. King said, there are more things that put us together than what divide us. But one educator man said, whatever you focus on grows. So if we focus on the division, that's going to grow. Right. If right. we focus on what unites us, that's going to bring us closer that's together. Right. That's it. Yeah. And so we want to, again, thank you for coming. Thank you, Mr. King, for sharing knowledge. My viewers have asked that you even become a regular guest here at Focus on Liberia because they want to learn from you. Well, if it is concerning public safety and mindset change, I sent you the information that I'm doing with the, with the youth in Liberia, correct? Yes, you did. Yes, but since 2008. So I'll be happy to, if, if you feel that it's worthwhile to share, yeah. I'll be happy to. We'll, def we'll definitely look for sponsors so that uh, you can, you can share the knowledge as we continue to elevate, to educate, and promote all things Liberia. Our show is continuing tomorrow and also over the weekend. Uh, tomorrow, uh, on Sunday, first of all, on Saturday, we're going to have someone from the Unity Party who's going to defend the Unity Party against allegations that have been made against the Unity Party. And that's Mr. George Preston Lobo, who's a vice chairman for CDC, uh, Liberty, Unity Party USA. Also on Sunday, we're going to have a panel discussion about these deaths in Monrovia. I call them murders in Monrovia. We have murders in Cassava Pass this time. We have murders in Monrovia. Yeah, and so we're yeah. going to have a panel discussion for us to go over what really has happened and what we librarians can do about it. I see this just has the same way we responded to Ebola, to COVID-19. If something like this tragic happened, four persons die, and we see the same pattern, people of the same professional background dying. That is scary. That's uh, screaming our attention. Also, tomorrow at noon, we're going to be talking with an election expert. Elections going on, we have referendum, we have the voter, and all other things surrounding elections 2020. We want to kind of ex have someone who is an expert in elections in Liberia come to us and explain all these things and uh, kind of enlighten us what we need to know concerning elections. That's going to take place tomorrow at noon, and the guest is Mr. Josiah Jokai an election expert in West Africa. So again, thank you, Mr. King. Thank to our viewers and thank to our back room, the guy who is uh, controlling the technology back there. I want to say thank to all of you. Until then, my name is Dennis Jha saying good night. We're going to end with the song that say, we are all Liberians. Whether you are Gio, Mano, Crew, Grebo, 
Americans, Liberians. Yes. Whatever you are, we are all Liberians. And we are obligated to do whatever it takes to make Liberia that country that we all dream of has the glorious land of liberty. Good night, folks. God bless. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are Liberians.